So let's welcome our next speaker, uh, Professor Shoghi Devlin. Shoghi Devlin is an uh, assistant professor at UC Berkeley, and his work focuses on machine learning for decision making and control. So with an emphasis on deep learning and reinforced learning, reinforcement learning algorithms. So applications of this work include autonomous robots and vehicles, as well as computer vision and graphics. So today, he's going to give a talk on end-to-end -end learning of perception and control. For the previous week. So my name is Sergey Levin, I'm an assistant professor at UC Berkeley, um, and kind of by way of introduction, I wanted to start off by showing a few uh, pictures of the kind of stuff that we do in my group. So I work on uh, machine learning, uh, especially deep learning and reinforcement learning, and also how uh, you know, algorithms from those fields can be extended and applied to real-world robotic systems. So I don't actually do that much work on tactile sensing, but I do care a great deal about sensing in general. So in this talk, um, I'll tell you some of my thoughts about uh, robotic sensing and some of the issues that we have to contend with and how I think those issues might be addressed. But then at the end, I'll wrap up uh, with, a, with a section about one recent project that we did on tactile sensing, actually in collaboration with Teddy Olson's group. Um, but you know, you'll forgive me if most of the talk is actually about visual sensing, but I, I promise that the lessons are ones that, um, you know, are ones that, that uh, can carry over to other modalities. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm actually quite interested in tactile sensing now because I think it's, it's something that's important for us uh, not just to figure out how to do tactile sensing, but to figure out how to do sensing in general correctly, because I think it's uh, studying tactile sensing can help us figure out general sensing uh, mechanisms that are a little bit more, uh, in some sense, human-like and maybe a little bit more general. So let's uh, imagine that you're a robot and you're confronted with this scene and you, and you want to use vision to figure out how to do something. Here, maybe you want to pick up a particular object or you want to use that microwave to cook a meal. Vision, uh, it's very tempting to regard vision as a very global modality. So you can look at this camera image and you say, well, okay, maybe the first thing I need to do is I need to you know, identify all the objects in the scene. Maybe I'm going to segment, segment them out, maybe uh, reconstruct the geometry. <coughs> That's like a pretty good model-based representation that I can just uh, put in a box and hand over to the next uh, subsystem in my robot that's going to maybe plan some trajectories uh, and then uh, execute a motion for the scene. So it's very tempting when you have a very global modality like vision to take a very global view of perception to say like step one, pull out all the information you need, step two, send it to the planner, step three, execute the plan, uh, and things will kind of work. Um, but that's not really how people tend to approach things like this. You know, there's there's a, a very basic biological reason for it. Our vision is foveated. We, uh, perceive things very actively, so you don't take in the whole scene at once, you're going to glance at some aspect of that scene, you're probably going to actually make up your mind about what you're going to do before you even identify that there's a spray bottle hanging over on, on the top left. You'll probably just look for the thing you care about, begin acting, as you begin carrying out your, uh, uh, your behavior, you might glance around a little bit more, collect a little bit more information about the scene, and everything is in a very tight loop. Uh, so uh, with the vision, at least the way computer vision is done today, um, it's probably not very easy to go this route. It's a lot easier to do, the, to do this thing uh, because that's just the, kind of the way that our computer vision algorithms work. Uh, with touch sensing, there's sort of no way out of, the, out of doing it uh, you know, in some sense properly because it is a very active modality. So you have to actually go in there and choose to perceive. And if you have to choose to perceive, then you're going to be a lot more frugal with your perception. And there's a lot of benefit in actually closing the loop of perception. Now, uh, that's, that's maybe the, the higher level some philosophical picture, but um, let's uh, narrow down into something a little more specific. So in this talk, I'll talk a lot about uh, grasping, uh, because I think uh, that's a very interesting uh, application domain in which to explore interesting sensing uh, problems. So imagine that we'd like to have a robot that needs to grasp this saw. The way that we would do robotic perception today typically uh, looks something like this. We identify some bits of information that we need to know about the scene. We work very hard to pull out those bits of information from the data that's coming in from our sensors. We throw out everything else, all the, let's say, pixels and the and, and, uh, point, uh, point cloud and so on that we get from the song, and we just take that little bit of information that we believe is important, and then we use it to actually perform some tasks. So if you want your robot to pick up the song, well, depending on how you're doing it, maybe you need to know where it is in 3D space. So perhaps you need to localize it. If you have a stereo camera or a depth camera, this is reasonably straightforward. If you have a monocular camera, it's a little bit harder. 
Now, maybe if, you, if you're using some kind of planning algorithm to actually plan a grass, maybe you also need to know the spatial extents of the sock. Maybe you need to segment it out or even reconstruct its geometry. And once you do that, you throw out the original pixels, uh, take your, uh, your voxel grid or your position or something, and you hand that over to your motion planner. Uh, but this thing is a deformable sock, so actually if you knew that it was a sock, all you have to do is just pitch it like right there in the middle, and you don't really need to know anything else about it. So in this particular case, we simultaneously managed to get too much information and too little information. So, so it's too much information because we don't really need the geometry of this thing. We don't even need to be super precise about its position. And it's too little information because if we choose that abstraction, if we choose, let's say, 3D geometry, just to pick something uh, arbitrarily, 3D geometry as a representation, we get too little information. We discard the appearance, which is the thing that we actually need uh, in this particular case to make the right decision. So if we pick our abstraction manually and we don't do it perfectly, we get both too much and too little. So too much means we have to solve too hard of a problem, and too little means that we don't actually succeed at the end. Now, of course, if you're picking up something like a big heavy power drill, it's the opposite. There, the material properties, you know, if you're not going to pinch this thing, you really need to know the, the shape. Maybe you need to even know the weight distribution, where the center of mass is, and so on. So depending on what you're doing, you might need different bits of information. So then the big question is, what if we don't know which information from the sensors is the most important? If we don't know what information from the sensors is the most important, then it's very hard for us to pick that, that uh, ideal little uh, kernel of, of, of information that we can pull out from our sensors and then discard everything else. Now, the good news is that robotics is not the first uh, 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 kind of feel that has had to deal with this problem. So computer vision has had to deal with this kind of stuff for a very long time. And in fact, if you uh, go back about 10 years and you see how computer vision uh, was done, it would typically look uh, very similar to the story ahead of the previous slide. You have your pixels in your image, and then you choose some kind of uh, representation, some little piece of information that you believe is important for the thing that you want to do. So if you want to classify objects in your image, maybe you pull out something like a histogram of orange gradients, or maybe like a formal parts model if it's, uh, if it's a person. And then you would build a classifier on top of that to do the thing you want. And each time you pull out some level of representation, you discard everything that came before it. So the assumption is that whatever you get over here is everything you need to make your decision. Uh, and this was very, very hard. The thing that actually ends up working really well in modern computer vision is not to do this, but instead to actually use a very powerful and highly expressive function approximator that can be trained directly on the raw sensory reading. It just so happens that this function approximator is typically a deep neural network, but that's actually not the point, I think. I think the point is that whatever it is, it's actually trained end to end on the thing you eventually want to do. So if you want to detect tigers, this thing is going to find you all the most uh, important tiger-like features directly from the pixels in your image. So by the time anything is discarded over here at the top, it has already been adapted to the task that you want to solve. So it's already pulled out everything you need for the task because that's what it was trained to do. So, what I'm going to discuss in this talk is how we can apply this idea uh, to robotic sensing. Uh, initially, actually, visual sensing, but uh, in the end, I'll conclude with some discussion of tactile sensing. So I'm going to talk about three questions in this talk. The first is how can end-to-end -end training of sensing and actuation enable grasping and hand-eye coordination? This can be with visual sensing. How can we combine semantics and spatial reasoning in an end-to-end -end framework? And lastly, does combining vision and touch enable more reliable behavior for grasping? And we have a little controlled experiment that we did uh, fairly recently uh, that I'll present then. So let me start with the, the first topic. So I, I told you before that it's, uh, you know, it's quite nice that if we can train things end to end, we can actually pull out the right kind of information from our data. But of course, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword because if we're not specifying that, that little bit of information that we need by hand and we're learning it from the data, we must be paying some price. And the price that we pay is statistical efficiency. So uh, the good side of this is that you can do a really good job, for example, in, in terms of visual perception. The bad side is that you need more data to do that. So if you look at, for example, some of the really amazing generalization results that were obtained in computer vision uh, by training on things like the ImageNet data set, well, the ImageNet large scale visual recognition challenge has about 1.5 million training images. And every single one of those images is annotated by hand by a human being to label the class of objects present in that image. So that's quite a lot. Uh, so why so many? Well, it's because now, if you're doing this thing, you don't really need to learn the decision rule, but you also need to learn the representation. Basically, you need to figure out what is it about the data that's actually useful for your task, and that's going to require a lot more data. So you have essentially less prior knowledge, which means you need more data. So how can we get enough data so that robots will actually generalize, so that we can use this idea in a robotics context and actually get the kind of an interesting generalization that's useful for real-world tasks? 
Well, there are a lot of ways that we can try to attack this, uh, but I'm going to talk about one reasonably straightforward, and it's actually the most straightforward, which is just to collect more data. Uh, this uh, is sometimes a little bit tough to, um, to really get a handle on in a, in a sort of a, a standard robotic learning context where we typically get into the habit of saying, okay, we'll run one experiment, we'll do it, you know, this will take you know, uh, maybe a graduate student a day or so to do, and then the next time we'll start from scratch. Uh, but if you're actually building robots, if you're actually deploying them in, in the real world, if you have, you know, let's say you're a company that wants to build lots of robots, if you're successful, you're going to have lots of robots out there, so you might as well actually have them collect data, share that data, and improve from their experience. So we wanted to get a little preview of what something like this might look like. So this is an experiment that we did um, actually um, at Google. Uh, and here we have a, a large-scale collective robot learning experiment. This is a vision-based experiment, so again, there's no tactile sensing here. But uh, all of these robots are all collaborating together, and they're jointly collecting a very large data set for grasping, because we want to see basically how far can you actually generalize if you do get the same scale of data as we have in, uh, for example, image recognition. So this, uh, the, these are 14 robots. Uh, we actually have uh, another setup that, that we're using now that has about 10 robots. Um, the total number of graphs for the experiments that I'll show will be about 800,000, which comes out to roughly 3 million uh, images. So about the same order of magnitude as the image recognition. And then we have a newer data set that's a bit bigger than that. So the setup is going to be the following, that you have a 7 degree freedom arm. Uh, it has a two-finger gripper, uh, and it's going to be picking objects out of a bin, and it's going to be using a monocular camera to do it. Uh, the camera actually is a depth camera, but we're not using the depth sensor for these experiments. We do use the depth sensor for a baseline comparison. The camera is not actually calibrated, so all the different robots are going to have slightly different camera placements, uh, which uh, you know I'd like to say that was intentional. It wasn't entirely intentional, but it turns out to be a really good way to study hand-eye coordination, because if they have slightly different camera placements, they can't rely on simply memorizing the camera transformation and have to actually pay attention to where their hand is in order to servo it to objects. So the hand is controlled at uh, 2 to 5 hertz. Uh, there's, the arm is controlled continuously, uh, which allows it to servo the gripper to the target and also to correct its mistakes. So if it pushes something out of the way a little bit, uh, if it perturbs the scene, it can change its mind and fix that. There is no prior knowledge about grasping in this approach, except for one very important uh, thing, which is whether or not the grasp succeeds. So we need some way to understand whether the grasp succeeded or not, and then we can collect uh, large amounts of data. So the, the success is determined using a handcrafted heuristic, but that's the only label we need, so we actually don't need the 1.5 million images being labeled by human labelers here. And that's actually part of why the scales, that even though it takes a long time for the robots to get the data, they collect it autonomously. All right, so here's the, the way that the grasping system is actually going to work. Uh, there's a, a convolutional neural network that's going to take in the image that the robot has seen. Uh, it's going to take in the motor command that the robot wants to execute and will predict, given the image of the motor command, whether the grasp will actually be successful. So a uh, fairly simple setup in the parlance of reinforcement learning. Uh, this is uh, analogous to a state action value function or a Q function. The way that the data is collected is uh, we run the robot using whatever the latest uh, network is. It's going to move around, uh, push things a little bit, and eventually it'll close the gripper and attempt to pick up an object. And that will produce the label that we have over here. So we'll report the actions, we'll report the images, and that will be our data set. And then at test time, when we actually want to use this uh, network to do something, we will uh, randomly sample a large number of actions at every time step, in parallel evaluate all those actions to see how good they are, and pick uh, the best one. In, in practice, when we collect the data, we actually pick something in the 90th percentile to get a little bit of random exploration. So the robot will go in, pick the best actions, and eventually pick up the option. OK. Um, I wanted to show you this picture up here, because this is showing the view from the cameras of all the different robots. So, I, so there's 14 of them. And this is just to, to show you some of the difference in viewpoint. It's not very large, but it is definitely noticeable. So you can see like the robot base is visible over here, whereas it's not visible at all over here. So the cameras do point in slightly different directions, and that's part of what forces the robot to actually have to pay attention to both its gripper and objects in the scene, and actually perform hand-eye coordination instead of simply memorizing the camera transformation. OK, so uh, let me show you the evaluation. Uh, so there's two questions we're trying to answer. Can a learned grasping system actually generalize, and is there benefit in continuous visual feedback? So these uh, experiments are all done entirely on uh, uh, novel objects that were not seen in training time. The comparison here, so this is, this is the method that I described. The comparison here is, an open, is to an open loop grasping method that uses a known camera tri uh, tri uh, calibration uh, to simply detect the most graspable patch in the scene and then just use a conventional motion planner to plan a path there. Uh, and uh, this is roughly analogous to some work from Pinto and Gupta and Carnegie Mellon that did uh, also uh, self supervised grasping for robots about a year prior to this work. So on the right, you can see our method. On the left, you can see the open loop method. 
And the overall failure rate for the, for the open loop method was about 33.7% on new objects. For ours, it was about 17.5%. And we also tested a kind of a conventional uh, hand design baseline method that used a depth camera and uh, a segmentation algorithm. And that had a failure rate of about 35%, so about the same as this. So you can see there's a pretty, pretty substantial improvement here from uh, actually incorporating, uh, well, first from the data-driven approach and also from incorporating continuous hand-eye coordination. So this is coming back to this point I made at the very beginning of the talk about a more active approach. So the robot actually uh, can, goes in, into the scene right away and then it, it can change its mind and move the gripper around based on what it's actually seeing. So it's kind of a more active approach to perception. Sergey? Yes? In the depth of segmentation, mm -hmm. that's also the color of Yes, exactly. So, so both of these, they look at the scene, pull out so, so some piece of information, and they look at it. Not for this one, no. Is there a tactile or force sensing? In this one, there's no tactile or force sensing. There will be at the end. Yes. At which point does the gripper kind of hover above the objects, and when does it actually go down and start interacting with them as they're moving around? So it's uh, there's a, there's a little bit of a, um, a kind of a a detail that I, that I skipped over, which is how you actually sample the actions. So the actions are sampled at random for a particular distribution. The distribution you can think of as sort of like a, a downward facing bowl, so it moves down and then side to side. So wherever the gripper currently is, imagine like a downward facing bowl from that, and that's where you sample the actions. Okay. Um, it's, I think it's also interesting to look a little bit at the, um, uh, at the qualitative results from this method. Uh, if you remember earlier on in the talk, I, I discussed this example with the saw. So I'm going to show you four different objects. They're all visually kind of similar. They're all blue and roughly the same size. They're not particularly difficult objects to grasp, but for the first three, you can see the robot adopts pretty much the strategy you expect. It puts the fingers on either side and picks up the object. This fourth object you're going to see is a soft, deformable sponge. Um, and it actually pinches it in the middle. But this is actually not an accident. So uh, for cloths, sponges, and so on, this kind of behavior is actually consistent. In fact, if we train on smaller amounts of data, that's usually the first thing that comes out. So even before it figures out how to reason about geometry, it figures out the material properties turn out to be pretty important, uh, which is perhaps something to think about also in the context of tactile sensing. And material properties are a lot easier to get with the right kind of tactile sensor. I'd imagine this kind of stuff would work even better. Um, we can do grasping and clutter. So this is sort of a, a nightmare grasping scenario that we can talk to. Um, it's not successful every time, so you'll see that uh, periodically it will drop some objects, but it actually does a reasonably good job of uh, eventually emptying out the spin and picking up uh, things even from very dense clutter. Um, all right, so the second thing that I'll tell you about reasonably quickly is how can we combine semantics and spatial reasoning in an end-to-end -end framework? So, so far, uh, I, I told you about a setup where we basically just ask the robot to pick up something. Uh, we don't particularly care what it is, just uh, pick up everything that's in, that's in the bin and do it as successfully as possible. So we can kind of visualize what the model is predicting by overlaying uh, each of these lines and sort of showing a candidate position for the gripper. We can overlay these lines. And the greener the line is, the more likely the model thinks the grasp is to succeed. So kind of what you expect, you know, if you pick up the eraser over here, it'll likely work. If you try to pick it up out here, it probably won't work. But what if we want the robot to pick up specific objects? What if we want to say, uh, pick up an eraser or pick up a toy? Uh, we need some way for it to reason about semantics. Uh, so can we actually learn to grasp objects from specific categories via self-supervised data collection without having to get the 1.5 million uh, labels uh, from, uh, from humans? Well, we need some, for this we need some amount of uh, labeling from humans because robots don't know anything about semantics a priori, so we need at least humans to tell us you know, what different categories are. But we can actually use uh, self-supervised data collection to get that number down to be pretty low. So uh, a standard computer vision approach to this problem would be something like, well, let's run a bounding box detector on the image, figure out where the object is, and then go in and grasp things inside that bounding box. That makes perfect sense. Uh, but there's a number of uh, issues with this. First, collecting uh, bounding box annotations uh, is expensive. Uh, it's actually more expensive than <coughs> collecting even semantic labels because someone has to actually localize the object in the image, click on points, and so on. And in practice, that's going to limit your data set size. That means that you'll have less data to train on because each data point costs more, more time, more money, and so on. But there's a, a bigger problem, which is that it suffers from the same issue as what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk of having both too much and too little information. So bounding boxes by themselves are not enough to figure out where an object is in order to grasp it. Here's an example. Let's say I want to pick up the Allen wrench. 
Um, you can see the Allen wrench is right there in that box. But if I give you this box, that's, uh, it's kind of hard to actually figure out how to pick up the Allen wrench in there, just because there's so much dense clutter right around there. Um, and it's also uh, perhaps too much, because uh, if you, you know, going back to the sock example, you don't really need to know its spatial extent, so you just need to know one point on it, just so you can pick it up. So again, uh, both too much and too little information, and a limited data set size. But we can do a bit better. So um, what we can do is we can take the model that we had before for uh, just grasping arbitrary objects and just ask it to predict not only will the grasp succeed, but also what the, uh, the class of the object that's picked up will actually be. So now we can just ask them all, tell us the class, and maybe failure will be one of the classes. And the way that we can supervise this model is as following. We have the robot pick up random objects uh, and then show them to a camera. Uh, this camera up here. There's a bunch of other cameras in the scene, but those are not the ones we're using. Uh, so show them to the camera up here. And then when the robot shows the object to the camera, it'll be in a canonical pose that's relatively easy to classify. And then we can ask uh, uh, human users to classify a small number of those canonical poses. And we can actually get uh, label propagation from only 30,000 labels. So uh, substantial, or 20,000, sorry substantially less than what we need for uh, general uh, image classification protection. So uh, I'll go over this pretty quickly because I'm running a little low on time. Uh, so I'll just show you the, um, the, the video of, of, of the robot actually doing these tasks. So here it's being asked to pick up particular objects like a toy. Um, uh, and uh, it's doing a reasonably good job with this. Uh, the task is actually fairly hard. So the success rate ends up being around 40% for picking up the right object successfully. But it does a lot better than, uh, for example, the bounding box approach. So here's what you do if you just pick up arbitrary objects. You get about a 12% success rate just because the number of object, objects that's put in the scene is, uh, is limited, so just chance gets you about 12%. If you use the bounding box approach, it gets you an improvement a little under 20%. Uh, but uh, different variants of the self-supervised model, especially the two-stream model that I didn't have a chance to describe, can get up to a size 40%. And part of that is also by incorporating other sources of data. So if you have uh, a model that can separately predict grasp outcome and grasp class, you can actually supervise the outcome with non-semantic data. So you can have more data for predicting success or failure uh, from even the stuff that you weren't able to annotate and then use the annotation just for the class. OK, so let me get to the, uh, the last part, uh, which I really want to make sure I get a chance to, to go through, which is does combining vision and touch actually enable more reliable behavior? This is, these are fairly uh, uh, preliminary initial experiments, but I think they get at this question uh, in an interesting way. So this is work that was done in collaboration actually with, with Ted Adelson's lab. These are the students and the postdocs that were involved. And the setup here is that we're going to use, we're going to do self-supervised grasping, but now we're going to use uh, a uh, color camera as well as uh, two tactile sensors. These are uh, gel side sensors that I think were uh, discussed in an earlier talk in this workshop. So at a high level, uh, the principle is that there is a uh, a camera inside each of these two uh, uh, little sensors that's looking at a piece of gel uh, with uh, an LED uh, uh, illuminating from either side. So when an object actually presses into the gel, the illumination from the LEDs allows you to, to see the annotation on the other side. So uh, it's a high resolution tactile sensor. And the nice thing about it is that it basically produces camera images, so we can process them pretty much the same way that we processed the camera images for the vision-based grasping. So then the question that we wanted to answer in this project is, does including tactile sensor readings actually make the robot better at picking up objects? So uh, regardless of whether or not the, the modality is useful for predicting some property of the object, this is actually functionally better. Can you actually do a better job of picking things up? Uh, so the setup here is a little bit uh, simplified from what I showed before. It's going to use a, a smaller data set, uh, and it's a little bit more focused. So it's not grasping clutter. It's grasping individual objects. And the setup is basically that we're going to put the gripper on the object, we're going to take measurements from the sensors and from the camera. And then we're going to decide, do we think this grasp will succeed or not? And if not, we'll release the object and regrasp it in a different pose. Uh, and during data collection, we choose uh, an arbitrary grasp around the object, pick it up, and measure the outcome by seeing whether it stays in the air for a certain amount of time. So then the, uh, the uh, learning approach is actually even simpler than before. There's actually no action that goes into this, just the uh, readings from the camera and from the two tactile sensors. Each of these is processed by um, a VGG-style uh, convolutional network uh, with late fusion. So once uh, each of the sensory modalities is processed separately, then we fuse the, uh, the top layers in each of the convolutional stacks. And that's used to predict whether a grasp, the, the grasp that you currently, uh, currently have will succeed or not. And again, if, you, if you're not happy with it, then you just release and find a new grasp. So the training was done on 84 objects with about uh, 
3,000 uh, grasp attempts, so quite a bit less actually than in the previous project, mainly aimed to get some preliminary results on how well this would work. Uh, here are some uh, pictures of the readings from the tactile sensor. Uh, and the first thing we did is we looked at the error rate on test set, so this is not actual grasping outcome. This is just uh, what we get if we have uh, a test set that wasn't used for training and we just see the prediction. So we rebalance the classes so they're about 50-50. Uh, if you use only uh, vision, this is error rate. Uh, your error rate is uh, in the 30s. If you use only a depth camera, then it's actually a bit higher, so it turns out that color uh, images are very useful for this. If you use just tactile sensing, you get around 25, so already better than vision. And if you combine both vision and tactile sensing, it's uh, around 16, 17%. So uh, at least on the test set, it's showing a pretty uh, concrete improvement from including tactile sensing and even more improvement from combining multiple modalities. Uh, the actual grasping experiment was done on eight objects that were not seen during training. Again, as I mentioned, this is a somewhat simplified setup, so there's no clutter. You're just going in and grasping the individual objects. Um, and again, the question we're trying to answer is, does including tactile sensor readings make the robot better at picking up objects? So these are the rates for each of the, uh, the test objects. Um, to explain what the different rows are, this, this is the important column to look at. This is what happens if you just uh, basically use the mechanism that we have for proposals. So during data collection, we propose a grasp in the vicinity of the object. That exceeds 34% of the time because it's largely random. If you use the only the visual modality to predict the outcome and then choose good grasps, you get about 66%. And if you combine them, you get 76%. Now that said, this grasping system is not particularly sophisticated. It's only executing relatively simple top-down pinch grasps. And the mechanism for actually correcting it, if you are not happy with your prediction, is to randomly sample a new grasp. So these numbers can probably be improved quite a bit. But it's a fair comparison in the sense that both of these rows have the same mechanism. All right, so to summarize, I talked about how in the conventional approach to robotic sensing, we often uh, think about sensing as picking out some piece of information about the objects that we believe is necessary for the task. And we often end up with a situation where we get both too much and too little information. So uh, we have to deal with this question of what if we don't know which information from the sensor is the most important. And one of the ways we can deal with it is by training end-to-end -end on the task that we actually want to do. I talked about how we can do this in the context of grasping, grasping with semantic labels, and also incorporating tactile readings and trying to see if there's benefit in combining multiple modalities. Uh, these are the, uh, the collaborators that were involved in this work, and I'd be happy to take any questions. So, a couple of questions. So, first, on the work with the with multiple robots, 14 robots mm -hmm. learning, is, did you do an analysis of how much data was actually needed and useful? Did you need 14 robots? Was it um, useful to generalize the transport yes. of your robot? Was very, very good question. I haven't done an extra slide on this. Sorry, I don't, I don't mean to, to take up extra time, but uh, yes, we did. Uh, actually, on a different uh, robot. So if you want to know how much data is needed, uh, if you train from scratch, look at the blue line and the x-axis is the log scale for the amount of data, and this is the failure rate. So it's, it's an S-shaped curve, unsurprisingly. Uh, and this is the number of images, so you can roughly divide it by 10 to get the number of grasps. Each grasp is about 10 images. So this is actually a different experiment, but it was roughly analogous. Uh, the, the main purpose of this experiment is actually to test transfer to combine data from this robot and this robot. But if you want to know just the amount of data, that's the blue line right here. So it's, you'll notice that it's actually still, still improving, so we could probably collect another couple of million and we get better. And then having, what, what about transfer? Even on, on robots of the same type, right? If you learn, if, if train on 14 robots and then train on 15, but that's the same type. But it will have different yep. slight change, friction, yep. control differences. Yes. Uh, we did this inadvertently a couple of times because uh, we had to replace some segments of these robots. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't have a very uh, rigorous like, uh, quantitative measure of that. I do have a, a quantitative measure of what happens when you go to a different robot, uh, which maybe I, I can take offline because it'll take a little bit of time to explain. But um, transfer happens. It's not super conclusive. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. Yes. Can you look at the transfer between different rivers? Uh, not yet. That's that's on the agenda, but not yet. Um, <coughs> so I'm curious about the, the work with the semantic. Mm -hmm. there's, there's some older work in like forms learning and forms learning grasping where it was shown that if you condition on the class, mm -hmm. that then the grasping test. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a cup. You have a Ah, okay. So w one detail. Uh, this, this is actually the opposite. So, right, right. So I'm curious if you try. Yeah, to set up we, did, we didn't try to flip it uh, for a very practical reason, which is that we can't. We actually don't have uh, labels in the original scene. So we, the only thing we have labels for is when the robot actually presents the object to the camera, 
when it's in the scene, we actually don't even have a mechanism for uh, for figuring out where the object is. We just have a mechanism for posting graphs. Okay. Question. So I'm interested in feature selection because the promise of deep learning is, oh look, you just run the data and get feature selection. I noticed that you put a camera on the wrist now for the second or the yes. last set of experiments. Was it, we weren't using it for this stuff, but uh, we will someday. Oh, so the camera wasn't being used. You're still using it. Yeah, yeah it was, it was still using the shoulder. That's why I had that little label that says someone else's camera. <laughs> uh, okay. it's a, it, it is a camera attached to the robot, but it's not using that. Because experiment. I would argue cameras on the wrist, more than one, would change your success numbers. And I, I, I agree. That's why we're trying to, 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 to run those experiments now. Okay, but isn't that fundamental? That's a human making that decision. To where to put the camera. And how many cameras? Da -da 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 -da. Yes. Uh, so that, that, that's, that's, that's exactly true. Uh, in fact, the, the reason we wanted to stick with the shoulder-mounted camera for, for the stuff we have so far is just for consistency. I think exploring you know, what happens when you put it in a different place. No, no, leap ahead to the new stuff. Just to see what is in the hot goblet of those narrow minded or something. Okay, so the second question. Did you take the in, the image from the gel site and run it through convolutional yes. neural nets? Uh, d despite uh, Wen Chen's wise advice to do something else, we actually just didn't have time to do the smarter thing yet. What is the smarter thing? Uh, the smarter thing is to actually use uh, all the, the clip. Okay, so let me, let me back up a little bit. Wen Chen, do you want to take this question? <laughs> it's, it's, your, it's your idea, so maybe uh, you should mention it. So you can see that there's this little pattern of, I'm going to like completely mess this up because I have no idea what I'm talking about. There's this, this little pattern of dots in the image, yes. uh, and uh, there is uh, a little bit of uh, kind of uh, model-based computation that you can do to figure out the uh, shear forces and things like that from looking at the motion of those dots. And in principle, you can turn that into, into the same kind of you know, 2D array and feed that as input. So, so this is really fundamental. Uh, you know, the promise of deep learning is choices like that don't matter. It doesn't matter if you, for example, combine this image with uh, the uh, external camera image and send to the system, oh, look, it's just one image. In theory, it shouldn't matter if you rearrange the pixels. So uh, that is correct, but with one very important caveat, which is statistical efficiency. So depending on how, how large of a data set you have, that those those choices do end up mattering a lot for statistical efficiency. So in the limit of infinite data and a sufficiently powerful function approximator and a function that's actually computable, it doesn't matter. If you have, let's say, 3,000 samples, then it matters. If you have 300,000 samples, it matters perhaps a bit less. If you have 300 million samples, it probably doesn't matter, but 300 million is quite a lot. But if you believe, as I do, that these deep learning bubbles are all finding local minima and overfitting and whatnot, uh, I think it matters hugely, even if you have infinite data, infinite time, infinite whatever. Because um, you're just falling into local minima that happen to work. So it's, it's hard for me to answer that question because I don't have infinite time and infinite data. Um, there is a, there's quite a bit actually of theoretical analysis uh, on the kind of local optima that are discovered by neural networks on large data sets. Uh, so far it's not completely conclusive, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that local optima tend to be fairly good for sufficiently over-parameterized function approximators. Because they're over-parameterized. Yeah, all I have to say is wishful thinking, and now there's a question. <laughs> was, so, I mean, it's kind of along the lines of, I mean, you're saying the structure matters, right? Uh, I'm saying the, uh, the, the, how you represent your data matters for statistical efficiency. Sure, exactly, right? And, and, and uh, motivation, a lot of, right at the beginning was, you know, we have to use a lot of data, and on robots, it's harder to get that data than. than uh, yes. Yeah, so, and the more of it you have, very likely the less it matters. So, there's another really nice structure, right, for the transfer between robots, of, like the manipulator code, mm -hmm. right? Like we did that's something that's somewhat generalizable in terms yes. of pass space motion. So, um, where do you see putting information like that into these systems? Um, yeah. So, so, data efficiency? so that, that, that's a good question. In the in terms of uh, the machine learning uh, theory underlying all this, it, it all ends up being the same thing. So anytime that you put in uh, domain knowledge into your system, you're trading off bias for variance. Uh, and that trade-off makes a lot of sense if you care about statistical efficiency. It makes less sense if you don't care about statistical efficiency and want the maximum performance. And that's going to be the story every time, regardless of uh, whether it's about uh, uh, transfer generalization, representation of data, and so on. It always ends up being a trade-off between bias and variance. But, but I mean, I mean, right. But then there's also 
we don't just deploy these systems, right? That you can think of the continuous learning, uh -huh. right? And so as you get more data, you're going to overcome your prior, yep. right, and decrease that. Yep. Right? So, do, but do you think that? Yeah, uh, I, see, I see what you're getting at. So oftentimes in practice, the trick ends up being uh, how, to, uh, how to incorporate just the right amount of bias in a way that doesn't prevent you from, from being able to, to eventually overcome it. So you can introduce a bias in a way that you can never overcome it. So if you use, for example, a linear uh, uh, classifier on pixels, that is a really harmful bias because it doesn't work very well and no amount of data will save you at that point. So, the, the, so for a practical robotic system, probably the trick is to actually introduce uh, the right kind of bias that actually makes it better, but it doesn't prevent uh, the you know uh, asymptotically actually reaching the right solution. Okay, probably there are more questions, but you're welcome to discuss that during the other break and during the kind of discussion. So let's thank our speaker again.